Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining tonight. Uh, my name is uh, Amiram. I'm uh, the founder of uh, Spotinst, um, and uh, we'll talk tonight about a very interesting topic that I'm speaking about lately a lot, uh, and it's how to achieve a serverless experience while scaling with Kubernetes. Uh, so it's going to be very interesting. Lots of uh, examples, uh, demo, and uh, I'd love this session to be interactive. So if you have a question, so just feel free to raise your hand and ask. Uh, we'll we'll do that this way. So let's start. Just before we we get into the technical stuff, so just a little bit about about Spotins. Uh, we've uh, established three and a half years ago in 2015. We've raised some money. Our main investor is Intel Capital. Um, we raised about uh, 50 million dollars. Just uh, recently closed our Series B. Uh, we're 120 employees around the world. We're headquarters in San Francisco. Uh, very happy to be here today. It was a very tough road from the city. Uh, so uh, thank you for coming. So what is Spotins? Spotins is basically a DevOps automation platform. Uh, we provide a workload management uh, for, for DevOps. We're helping them to scale up and down their workloads. And we mainly do that with uh, cloud access capacity. This is called Spot Instances on all major cloud providers. Today, we manage more than 250,000 uh, virtual machines on AWS for our customers, which yielding more than 2 billion of CPU hours every month. Uh, it's fairly a large number, uh, and it's just helping us to get better. Uh, one of our most uh, um, common workloads uh, is Kubernetes, and this is what we're going to talk about tonight. So the agenda would be the anatomy of Kubernetes, or just like Amazon ECS, just like very the same thing. Um, also, we're going to talk about when we scale with containers, we're actually scaling two layers. We're, as, we're scaling infrastructure layer, we're scaling containers layer. And then as we scale these layers, uh, we're going to talk about the way that we scale them. We usually um, scaled um, our environments based on metrics, but right now we need a better way when we use containers. It's not only metrics, it's containers. Um, and then we talk about what is serverless experience for containers, and we'll introduce a nice demo and solution of our recent product called Ocean, uh, integrated with our partners here in Yermada. Um, so let's go ahead. So anatomy of Kubernetes. I'm sure both of, most of you know it, uh, but basically what we have, we have a master. Uh, this is the control plane. It can be managed by a managed container provider like uh, GKE or EKS. This is where we store the database of, of Kubernetes, the API server, and the scheduler is running there. And then on the other side, we have all the worker nodes, which are actually running the containers. Each node has a container or a pod called kubelet, which is basically like the agent on the machine that's responsible for uh, um, reporting the status of the worker, scaling containers to the worker, and basically make this container, uh, this instance, as part of the cluster. Uh, also, we have something that calls services. Services is the way we ship or, or bring traffic or network traffic into the cluster. One of the most common ways of services as we know them is load balancer. It can be an Nginx, Ingress controller, Amazon ELB. And that's basically how it works. From the service, we will ship or we will route traffic in directly into pods. Great, so we have a cluster. Now we need to scale that. One of the ways, the most common way that we know about scaling cluster called metric-driven scaling, right? What is metric-driven scaling? It's basically when a given metric meets its threshold. We're scaling based on CPU or memory, and we're telling whenever I'm over 80 CPU, 80% 80 CPU, poof, I want more instances. Whenever we're lower than 30% CPU, I want less instances, right? But what's, what's the problem? The problem here with containers is that it's actually creating something that we call Tetris scaling challenges. Let's see what is Tetris scaling challenges. Let's look at this diagram. In this diagram, we'll look about the typical architecture of containers, which is basically we have infrastructure, which is the first layer, as you can see it down. Uh, this is infrastructure as a service. You have your cloud provider. You can buy different type of other sizes of VMs, like large, extra large, medium. And then you have your scheduler level, which is like the Kubernetes. 
And then on top of that, you'll be deploying containers. Now, your developers can create different containers from different sizes and types. So basically, there is like a mathematical problems that needs to be solved, which is matching these containers into these instances. Let's see a, an example, uh, a classic example of scaling the wrong pod size into the wrong instance size. So we have here a cluster of three instances. We have a C3 large, C3 2x large, and a medium. What we see here, all these um, small squares uh, basically are vacant places in the cluster that containers can be scheduled. You see this C3 large instance has one vacant place, the C3 2 Excel has one place, and the medium has two, right? Now, with the metric-driven scaling, basically, we have one, two, three, four vacant places to launch containers, right? So right now, I'm trying to launch this container, which is basically three vCPU and three gig of RAM, right? This is the units that I'm using. But basically, we cannot use it. We cannot scale that container, right? Because we don't have enough capacity on a single host to meet that requirement. So that's a classic example of, hey, the cluster thinks that he has resources, but in fact, we cannot scale the container. Now, let's see a problem of a wrong instance type. Right now, we have a cluster of M3 medium in C3 2x large. Uh, you see two vacant places in the cluster. and we want to scale a cluster, great, we're scaling up. And the problem is that we're introducing a medium instance. So again, we have four instance, uh, we have four vacant places in the cluster and we cannot really schedule the container. Let's see a scale down issue. Scale down is also very complex to handle when you run containers and instances in different sizes and types. In this cluster, we have medium, 2x large and medium. Each one of them is utilizing 50% CPU, right? It's running only half of the capacity that they can run. So basically, the Kubernetes, they want to scale down the nodes. So we'll be scale, scaling down the C3 2x because it's the biggest machine and we want to uh, uh, clear some waste from the cluster. So we'll take that instance down. But the problem is that this container, even though we have enough resources in the cluster, it won't be able to reschedule again in the cluster. And this pod is going to be in the pending pods it will not be scheduled. So there has to be a different way to scale containers into a large scale cluster. And we call it container driven scaling. It's not the metric driven. It's not about I have enough CPU and RAM because we saw that CPU, enough CPU and RAM can be really misleading. Uh, it's all about looking at a container and matching it with the actual host. So how do we do that? Basically, what we need as we scale up and down, we needed the instance size, type, and life cycle will be determined based on the pod and task requirements. So basically, when we look at Kubernetes cluster, containers are first class citizens. We cannot treat the host as first class citizens. We don't care about them anymore because we care about the pods. So if we look here, if we have a small pod, we'll get a small instance. If we have a large pod, it will get a bigger instance. If we have two small pods, we can maybe get a bigger instance. Think about it at the, at the large scale. If you want to scale right now from zero to a thousand pods in different types and sizes, we should apply some logic to make sure to bring enough capacity at one time. Any questions so far? How can you determine the life cycle? Great, good, good question. So next slide is going to answer not next slide, in two slides you're gonna see it. Basically, as you deploy a pod, you can put a tag on the pod. The default will be spot, because things in Kubernetes are usually stateless, unless you specify on-demand. And then the lifecycle will be determined as on-demand. More question, folks? Let's continue. Containers fragmentation on scale up and down should be fixed in a container-based or container-driven scaling. Let's see this example. We want to scale up in this example. So we have two instances, medium and X large, and we need to scale up a container. So what will happen, we will know to find the right machine or even change machines as we scale up and down and turn it from medium and X large to two large and one X large. Just because containers are first class citizens, more containers are being scaled 
and we need to match the infrastructure for the containers. Let's see on scale down, if you want to take one instance down, obviously we'll remove the medium one and we'll remain with the X large ones because we know that the container that's running on the medium one can fit into the X large one. So that's uh, a good way to scale down. In labels, tolerations, and taints, and that's to your question, so if you have a container with GPU, you'll put the tag of GPU, you'll get a GPU instance. If you need a container with an on-demand, so you'll put the tag of on-demand, you will get an on-demand instance. And something else, think about it, if you have a dev environment or something which is not really important in the cluster, you can even put a tag called low priority and this tag will force the cluster to give us more cheaper instances like burstable ones, T3, T2s, uh, lower uh, capacity instances to match into the cluster. That's very important. So now that we actually can handle, yeah, let's go with a question. So for stateful containers, that was the question, you can specify a tag called on-demand. So when you put on-demand on a container and you actually associate a PVC like um, um, uh, volume into that container, so it will not be scaled down, it will not be scaled up, it will just remain with its state. So that's how we handle this. More question there. So the question is, in a large scale cluster, we probably have a lot of defragmentation across hosts, so how do we solve that? So we'll show how the architecture is built in a, in a second. We have basically a pod running within your cluster. This pod sends all the topology of the cluster always to the SAS, and then the SAS always calculates how much host, how many hosts you have, how many containers you have, and what type of adjustments needed in the cluster in any given moment in order to squeeze the lemon. Good, so now that we actually handle scaled up, we handle scaled down, we handle labels, tolerations, stains, all of that sort of things, we're basically scaling containers are not, and not dealing with infrastructure. Because if we want a bigger machine, we'll get a bigger machine. If we want a small machine, we'll get a small machine. We don't need a DevOps, basically, to really touch the wires behind the Kubernetes to get the compute that we need. So that's what we call serverless experience. So you deploy a pod, you deploy a container, and you get compute. That's it. Just like I believe that most of you know the service of AWS called Fargate, right? You deploy containers. That's it. You don't need to handle with EC2 anymore. They're doing everything. They're getting the EC2. You don't even need to know what type of what type or size of EC2. So here is just like a serverless experience with more um, visibility and transparency. So what is a serverless experience as we define that? Because it's very tricky to say serverless on containers. The serverless people will will yell at us, right? So first thing is no management of underlying infrastructure. Right, we don't need to SSH into a VM anymore because we don't need to. We have a container, does everything that we need. The host is just being as a fuel, oil, right? That, that's it. Second thing is traffic shifting and Kubernetes give it to us. We can actually deploy new pods, deploy new versions. We can route the traffic between different versions in our application without downtime, without any major problem. Next thing is scale by request, uh, which means that if you look at Lambda, when you have like a, a single request, you will pay by a single request and you get like a very few amount of compute. And as you scale more requests, more containers of Lambda will be uh, uh, scaled and launched and you will be paying more. So here's the very same thing with Kubernetes. You will define horizontal port auto scaling. And then whenever you'll need more containers, you'll use more compute. Whenever you use less containers, you'll lose less compute. So you're actually scaling by request. It's the very same thing. Next thing is utility billing. You pay for only what you use and you can scale to zero. If your service is not running for some reason, it will automatically scale down. It's by definition in, in Kubernetes. So that's also completing the serverless experience here and also scale to zero, which we just touched about. And fast scaling. Fast scaling, I think, is the most important thing. We have customers today like Nextdoor and Ticketmaster. I'm very proud to say that all of you are purchasing tickets in Ticketmaster, going through a platform, um, managing over 
maybe more than 20,000 nodes the last time that we counted uh, running uh, uh, for Ticketmaster. And also Nextdoor had a very big issue because Nextdoor every 10 a.m. in the morning where all of their customers are logging into the platform, they don't need to scale from 10 containers to 15 or from 15 to 25. Uh, they're actually scaling from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of containers, just like in few minutes. And in the old way of scaling, in metric-based scaling, like there was a CPU limit uh, uh, threshold meets, uh, and then they were scaling up few machines and then other few machines, so their customers suffered a lot of uh, performance issues. And right now, they just need to bring 10,000 more containers. Uh, the platform recognized that, bring new capacity, and all the containers can actually run. Uh, so that's a very key thing here. Here, I'm very, very excited to talk about it. We're working on it for like in the past uh, 18 months. Uh, it's our newest product called Ocean. Um, and it's basically that, that layer that provides the serverless engine for, for Kubernetes. It does everything that we just discussed about, um, matching the instance type, size, lifecycle with all of the different components in the cluster. Uh, it works with, with Amazon EKS, with Google, um, with even Azure Container Service, uh, with just vanilla Kubernetes. Uh, it has on-prem support. Uh, it can run through COPS. Uh, and also working with our dear friends here uh, near Mata, which is uh, the demo that I'm about to show you. Uh, and before we dive into the demo, let's uh, go over the components of, of Ocean. So basically here what you see, uh, it's just like we've discussed, um, there is a layer between the infrastructure as a service, that's the purple one, that's the purple layer, uh, and the actual containers on top, uh, and Ocean sitting between. Uh, so it basically can scale horizontally and vertically uh, the, the machine based on the container size, uh, which is very cool and just like removing a lot of hassle from uh, DevOps teams. And as we've discussed, uh, one of the things, one of the key things is that you actually pay 80% less for compute. Uh, and why it's so important? Because when you use containers and microservices, you can basically tolerate uh, interruptions. Obviously, you don't want to lose half of your capacity at a single time. This is why uh, we bring some intelligent predictions not to replace too many instances at a single time. Um, and the auto-scaling that we've discussed about, that's something that uh, we have patented um, and just filed it a few months ago. Um, worked a lot about it uh, to actually meet and do container-based uh, scaling. Ocean is also on-premise support. So for those of you who are running Kubernetes in their on-premise, uh, you can install Ocean on your on-premise as well. Uh, we currently support uh, VMware. So if you have uh, a VMware-based environment, we can um, integrate with your VMware API and then match your specific host to the specific container, even in your on-prem. It can reduce your overall cluster by literally a lot. Um, that's the general architecture, so that's for your question from uh, back. Uh, what you see here, you can have a cluster on-prem or cluster in the cloud. The only thing you will have to do is to install on one of your worker nodes, one per cluster, so just one uh, pod per cluster. It's called Spawnings Controller. Um, it's just a pod, it's a deployment that run within your cluster, uh, and it actually takes all the topology of your cluster, like nodes, um, containers, um, uh, uh, um, budgets that you have in, in, the, uh, in the Kubernetes cluster and sends all of that information into the Ocean SaaS. This is where you can see the UI and control the clusters and see all the auto scaling and so on. Um, just a couple of screenshots before we go to the demo. Um, so what you see here is just a cluster. You can see where it's running in AWS, in which version of Kubernetes, the overall CPU and memory realization. Um, something, uh, another thing that you can see inside were very metric driven regarding the um, different resources that you are consuming. So you can see two different charts, which are very important when you manage a Kubernetes cluster. One of the chart is CPU and memory versus instances and CPU and memory versus pods. And why it's so important, because sometimes you deploy a lot of pods and you want to know how much instances it's yielding that you're actually paying for your cloud provider. And you also want to know how much CPU and RAM it's yielding. Uh, so 
that there is a lot of ways to consume 100 CPU and 100 gig of memory from the cloud from different type of VMs. You can run 100 VMs of one gig of RAM or one VM of one gig of RAM. Uh, so we're also showing you how many instances we used for that, uh, which is very important. Um, and also the distribution of instances across availability zones, across machine types and so on, uh, which kind of like uh, if you're a DevOps, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a, of a heaven. Uh, this is an uh, on-premise um, example. What you see here, just like a, a cluster running in an on-prem environment, uh, you can see how much it actually costs in on-prem. The operator can tell us how much it costs to operate the cluster on on-premise environment. And then we calculate how much it costs in the cloud. So you can basically decide whether if it makes sense to run it in the cloud or it makes sense to keep it on on-prem. And here, just great to see that uh, tweets uh, coming from customers uh, telling us ever since we start using it, we're not seeing any errors anymore when we scale up and down. Uh, it's just uh, disappearing. Uh, so let's take some questions before we go to the demo. So for migrations, um, I, today we don't like provide, we don't accelerate the migration with like a migration service. We basically, what will help you to do is to set up the very same cluster you have in the cloud, and then just to migrate deployment by deployment uh, on your Kubernetes, uh, in things that we're, we're building. Uh, but today you will have like a better understanding whether it's worthwhile to go to the cloud or actually no. A lot of people are not sure about it. Right, it's like, oh yeah, the cloud is cheaper. No, the cloud is more expensive. Here you have like a really um, precise uh, estimation. That's a great point. Uh, the point was if we see like a repeated pattern in scaling, so we can basically apply ML for um, like scaling even before uh, customers needs their, their capacity. So the answer is obviously yes. Uh, it's, it's something that we're actually working as we speak, predictive auto scaling. So you don't have to even wait for capacity. The capacity will be waiting for you. Um, so that's something that we're actually working as we speak. We see a lot, we see like a very similar pattern across all customers. Just like they have different time of the days that they need more capacity. Yeah, some more question here. Yeah, so the question is around uh, why it's so important to mix different instance type and sizes, and is it causing like performance variations? Um, so if you look about like general purpose um, uh, instances like M3, C3, R3 and four or five um, on all of these. So the performance is pretty much the same across all of these machines. And the reason why we're mixing between like C3, C4, C5, M3, M4, M5 is just to have a better access to more compute on AWS. So sometimes you would want to get 100 nodes on C4 large and they're not running out of nodes of C4 large in specific availability zone. So you can get C5 large in the same availability zone. You can get like R3 large. And then you can get the same amount of capacity just in a different type. The, per the performance will be the same. Containers will not move from R3 to T2. That obviously gonna create a lot of, a lot of issues. Uh, but all, all the general purpose, if you want a very large access to compute, just mix uh, from compute type and the performance will be pretty much the same. Does that make sense? So federation between cloud, great question. Um, as you know, the federation project, as we all know it, is basically dead. Um, there is something that is in the works, uh, like Google is working on it, as, as we know. Today, we don't do federations of cluster, but you can see all of your clusters, like Google, AWS, Azure, on-prem, in the same place. Uh, you'll have like different tokens and like you'll see the different access to the to the clusters, but we don't actually do the federation and privileges across the hosts, the across the uh, clusters. 
Yeah, I'm I'm biased, but um, but obviously uh, we we implemented for a customer who uh, who used uh, before Ocean and after Ocean. It was running already on spot instances, so like the cost of compute was pretty already cheap. Uh, but after deploying Ocean, the customer reported on 25% less compute in the cluster just because of like being able to minimize the compute and really packing it more uh, elegantly. Yeah, more question. We're looking at three parameters. Uh, one is compute, second one is storage, and the third one is networking. Uh, we're monitoring all the all these components, and this is what we're actually, when we look at the cost unit per server, we're looking at these three things. Usually the storage uh, would be pretty much the same across all instances because you're paying the same amount of gig. Uh, sometimes with networking, in bigger instances, you'll get better networking. So sometimes in bigger, like when we see containers that are, are consuming a lot of like packets, a lot of um, uh, networking, we'll most likely place them on bigger instances. And then we use these bigger instances just to deploy more containers. Uh, that's something that we do in order to get better networking for cheap, uh, for free. Um, and then compute is basically ratio of each machine and how much we can buy it in AWS. No, it's not only for AWS, it's also supported for Google and Azure as well. So these three major ones. Anyone here running on like different cloud like Oracle or Alibaba? Oracle? All right. Great. So I hope you can see that. Able to see that well, should I zoom in? Zoom in? All right. Great, so that's our pretty console. Um, you see here, uh, we're going to Elastic Group. Uh, we've prepared an Elastic Group, uh, which is, Elastic Group is the equivalent as we see it to auto-scaling group in the cloud. Uh, so AWS has auto-scaling, Google has instance group, and Azure has uh, virtual machines uh, scaling set called VMSS. So Elastic Group is the layer that basically does auto scaling across all these three vendors. We call it Elastic Group. Um, so I've prepared an Elastic Group which is called Nirmata. Um, I log in into the Elastic Group. You see here three instances running. I uh, just created it today. So it's running for 40 hours with potential of cost of almost $3.5, uh, and the actual cost was $1 because we're actually running it on spot instances, so it's about 70% of savings. Uh, we saved two bucks, great. Um, and what you see here, uh, that's a graph of an instance count. And in this graph of an instance count, you can see over time how many machines were in the cluster if we had to scale up and down. And according to the color of the area, you can see if that was a spot, reserved, or on demand. So if you already purchased reserved on either cloud, on Azure or AWS, uh, we'll utilize it first uh, to, again, squeeze the lemon. And then we'll scale spot on top of that. So we've prepared in this cluster three machines. One of them is running an on demand, which is running the control plane. And then two spot instances that are actually running the worker nodes. Um, you can see the distribution. We're running T3 large, T2 large, T3 medium, T3 medium. Very small budget for this for these cluster. Um, let's go and edit the configuration of this cluster and understand how we're actually creating a cluster like this. So when we create Elastic Group, we basically care about three main things. is general compute and scaling. Um, and mainly with Kubernetes environments, we don't need the scaling part because it's all happened automatically. Um, so on the general, we're actually choosing the region and then choosing our strategy of how to place capacity in the cluster. What you see here is basically, how would you like to optimize this cluster? Would you like to optimize it for availability, cost, or balanced? Um, basically, do you want instances that will be long, like? Uh, living like to longer time or you want it to be like very cheap 
even though it will be replaced every uh, couple of minutes. Um, you can select your spot percentage, whether if it be like 100%, 50%, you can really control that here. Or you can basically set an on-demand count, which is what we did here. Place one on-demand and then all the rest will be spot. Um, here you can utilize reserve first or not, or you can use fallback to on-demand when spot is not available. Why it's so important? Uh, one of our customers is Sony, uh, and Sony, when they're like uh, processing video uh, and there is no spot capacity in the cloud, they said, we don't want like on-demand, we can wait until capacity will come again. Uh, so you can basically uh, choose if you want to fall back to on-demand. Obviously, if you have SLAs, you would want to check this box. Um, and that's like really what matters here in the general part. Let's jump to compute for a second. Compute, we're basically choosing all the, we call it lunch specification, like uh, your virtual private network, your server OS type, uh, your different machine types, and so on. So what we're seeing here, uh, we basically give you access to all of the available machine types in the region. Uh, and this is really cool. Uh, the columns basically are the machine families and the rows are basically the sizes. Uh, and then if you want to use large, for example, and you don't want to have performance variation, so you could say, all right, I want M3, which has two vCPU and 7.5 gig of RAM, and M4, which has two vCPU and eight gig of RAM. So it's basically the same machine, just different generation. Uh, and here I have two and eight, again, in M5 large. And then as you choose these machines, uh, we're actually in real time building something that's called uh, spot market scoring. And that's basically the, our chances to access the compute in real time. Uh, so you see here we're running on two different availability zones, which is US West 2 and U, uh, A and C. Um, and here we're running the M3, M4, and M5. You see that the M5 large has a score of 73 on US West 2C and has a score of 95 on the other AZ. So it means that we're most likely going to launch M5s from this availability zone. It just gives like the DevOps or the developer uh, like good, bad as they are creating the cluster if we can access computer they want. Uh, and once it's all set up, we have a review tab, uh, which also um, very easy, like you see a summary, then you can basically export that as a JSON, export that as a cloud formation, or export that as a Terraform file. So you can basically cre create everything from the UI and have your Terraform file ready, take that Terraform plan and just run it uh, or include it in your existing templates. And once this is launched, we have an Elastic Group managed, just being scaled by uh, the SaaS uh, and I believe we're getting into the end of the demo, uh, which I'll leave more room for questions. And then Ritesh here from Nirmada will also uh, talk about, like, deepen, uh, I'll talk about uh, more about the integration with Nirmada and Spotins behind the scenes. Yeah. So basically, it's like um, it's it's use the customer you choose when you want to manage your masters. So if you look about managed containers providers, they're managing the master for you. You still need to like choose your worker nodes. Uh, so it's pretty much you know it's it's like your your preference uh, as a customer. Uh, there is no really a difference between a cluster which is managed by AKS or EKS. They're just managing for you the control plane. So we can recommend you what type of workers to use, what size of workers to use. The control plane is the very smallest and cheapest part. It's like EKS costs you 150 bucks per month and AKS, I think it's even free. So it's... Find out 
so in the future, we're actually going to show like um, uh, analysis. Like if you would run this cluster on a different cloud, it will cost you X. Um, to be honest, across all the different three big providers, the prices are basically similar. Uh, the main thing which is different is the experience, uh, like how different com Yeah, that's correct. Like different toolings, different features, different things like that, that is like it's a, it's a matter of choice of, of a company. Uh, we've seen that companies are completely okay to, you know, get married with a single cloud provider and they love everything that they do and that's fine. Um, we never saw a company that saw, oh, we have a cheaper medium instance on a different on a different cloud, we'll just switch. That's something that we, to be honest, we haven't seen that even in a large scale clusters. We've seen it like with like a decent, like uh, three, you know, each large uh, masters, they can handle like up to several thousands of nodes. So we never needed actually to scale masters. Uh, most of the times we're actually scaling the nodes. Uh, we're, mm -hmm. Right. So on our platform, every cluster is managed in a specific cloud. All right. So like if you create a cluster on AWS, it will be managed on AWS. If you create a cluster on Google, it will be managed on Google. And then we scale it up and down in the same cloud provider. In Google, for example, they allow you to do cross-region uh, cluster, so we support that as well. You can create like cross regions on Google cluster and will be managed in a single uh, UI. Does that make sense? So usually we'll do that across availability zones, and in Google we can also do it like regional. Uh, but we've seen that like most of customers are very happy with like. Uh, having um, their cluster being scaled on multiple availability zone, it's more than enough for them. Yes. Good question. So what is actually the trigger to scale up and down? The trigger is always looking at the cluster utilization. And then looking how many, how much vacant space you have in the cluster, and are you ready for the next container to be launched? So whenever Kubernetes, for you, for example, you as a developer, you want to launch a new container, and there is not enough space in the cluster, there is an error on Kubernetes saying there is a pod, unscheduled pods. So we're always monitoring this unscheduled pod area, and. Simultaneously, we're also monitoring the cluster state and we're looking if the headroom, we call it headroom, uh, which is the amount of in the cluster that is basically free and not running containers is getting lower. This is where we understand, okay, we think that the next container is going to be that big. So we're going to already scale up a new node. That's a trigger for us. Mm -hmm. So usually what happens on Kubernetes, so for example, let, let's take Nextdoor, okay? Nextdoor has a service on top of Kubernetes, all right? This service is defined by horizontal pod auto-scaling, all right? They know that whenever they need more capacity, more requests are coming in, they're just duplicating more containers to have more compute power. What we do is we listen to this horizontal pod auto scaling, and this is events coming from the customer. We see that this service needs more compute or we'll scale more infrastructure. Make sense? Again, can you repeat? Are we considering container webhooks? Absolutely. Yeah, we look at these webhooks uh, and we, according to that, we know exactly where to place them. Security is just like a regular Kubernetes. I hope everyone upgraded their clusters to 110. Um, so it's just a regular security uh, and or just another component in the cluster. Um, we're usually monitoring like uh, 
um, uh, very common security issues that we know on, on Kubernetes and sending like alerts to customers. Obviously, it's not our, our business, but we just want to make sure that someone who are using our, um, uh, our, our service is being secured. Good question. Cluster Autoscaler is an open source project of Google uh, that is basically you can um, use it to scale up and down nodes. Cluster Autoscaler is like very static. It will, just like an autoscaling, when you need new container, we'll just scale new node to the cluster. If you remember the examples that I showed, like you can like schedule a large pod and the Cluster Autoscaler will give you like a medium server. You'll scale like a tiny node, the Cluster Autoscaler will give you 16 XL server. This is like what defined by your DevOps. This is like more dynamic. Uh, basically, based on your pods, you will get instances. With Cluster Autoscaler, in order to achieve that, you need to have like multiple instance groups, multiple labeling. You need to manage a cluster, which is built of a lot of different uh, instance groups. Uh, and here, just it's just a one uh, pane of glass for, for autoscaling. So whenever the... Um, service is auto-scaling and ac actually asking for, we need right now a thousand new containers. Spawnings kicks in. We understand, all right, a thousand containers needs to be scaled. This is where we bring infrastructure. Um, we're looking to be more predictive, as you asked, and actually realize, oh, it's 10 a.m. in the morning, usually at 10, 15, you're scaling up. Uh, we'll have like, we'll change the minimum capacity in the cluster. But today we're listening to the service level, which asks for more containers. Uh, and as it asks for more containers, we're just putting infrastructure in place. In earlier version, in what uh, the question was in uh, what type of scale we see um, problems in, in cluster, like when, when it breaks. In earlier versions, like in Kubernetes 1.5, 1.4, 1.6, we've seen that like as you scale beyond like 1,000, 2,000 nodes, things like started to break, uh, especially in the ETCD and like managing the, the database of the Kubernetes. Right now, in like the um, the most uh, recent version, 1.10 and and above, uh, we see that cluster can contain more than 10,000 nodes without a problem. So we haven't seen like a number of nodes being a a like factor for for problems. Yeah, vCenter, vSphere. On our prem. Awesome. I hope it was uh, interesting. And uh, I'll hand it over to uh, Ritesh now for a few more slides. So I'll stop sharing. Anyway, if you have more questions, so just email a at spotins.com. That's my email. And I will gladly reply to any question you might have. All right, so I'm going to cover the part uh, two of the demo uh, that Amiram started. So I'm a founder VP products at Nirmata. Uh, our focus is uh, is actually managing the cluster, a uh, Kubernetes cluster, and applications that run on the cluster. So uh, you know, provi we provide a, a intuitive, flexible platform uh, that can operate Kubernetes clusters across clouds. In terms of uh, key capabilities uh, on our platform really focus on the full life cycle of uh, the application, starting with deploying the application to your cluster, uh, op operating and managing the application, uh, the workloads as well as the cl cluster underneath, and then uh, providing insights as well as uh, ability to aut 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 automate and, and tune your clusters as well as uh, automatically recover from failures and, and, and so on. So Nirmata, uh, we started out about uh, uh, four years ago, and we launched our product as a cloud-based service. Uh, this was pre-Kubernetes day, so we are mainly focused on, on containers and managing uh, and operating uh, applications running in containers. But since then, we've uh, over the last couple of years, we've uh, 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 in, in, uh, incorporated Kubernetes in our platform, so we, we can run, um, run and deploy applications uh, across Kubernetes clusters, across clouds, uh, as our our management plane, actually, uh, we have a cloud-based management plane. It's it's also as a, uh, delivered as a service, just like Spartans. And then we also have an on-prem version version of our product um, if, if for 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 large customers. So just kind of uh, to to continue the demo where uh, uh, Amiram left off, I'm going to just uh, share the the Nirmata 
dashboard. So we saw uh, there were three three nodes uh, or three VMs that were spun up uh, in the Elastic Group. So really, to kind of uh, in Nirmada, you can onboard any resources, any uh, any VMs instances. We have a, an option called Direct Connect, where you drop in our agent. So what what we did is uh, when these VMs were being spun up, uh, there was a Nirmada agent uh, that was dropped in. Uh, obviously, it needs um, uh, we need Docker running on on those on those instances, and and that's about it. Once that is done, um, the 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 instances are connected, and now you can start using them in Nirmata. And essentially, uh, at this point, the Elastic Group does, does the provisioning and, and, and scaling up and down of, of the, the resources. And Nirmata can take care of, of uh, scaling up and down uh, the Kubernetes cluster. So once the resources are available, we can actually deploy a Kubernetes cluster through Nirmata. Uh, so that uh, it's pretty much uh, uh, a, a Pretty straightforward step. There's a, a kind of a wizard that walks you through it. Um, in this case, I've already deployed a cluster. Uh, I can see uh, right now uh, all of my control plane components uh, are, are deployed and running, um, and and they're uh, they were deployed earlier earlier today. Uh, for, on each of my nodes, there's a kubelet and a proxy running. And now, if if a new new instance comes up, we'll ensure that that instance also uh, becomes part part of the cluster. Uh, Apart from that, in Nirmata, you can start uh, now uh, adding more more services, more applications to your cluster, uh, 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 and and essentially, uh, you know, uh, by starting by creating in, in what we call environments. So, in environments is uh, are a logical group uh, where you can actually for different uh, for different teams or for different uh, uh, different. Uh, stages in your application development, you can create an environment and map it to a particular uh, cluster. And this way, if you have a cluster, uh, potentially an on-prem cluster and a cloud-based cluster, you can have uh, different environments mapped to it and then start deploying applications on these. So just for, for this demo, I have a couple of uh, applications uh, here that are added into Nirmata. Uh, we comp support complete Kubernetes uh, 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 all the Kubernetes resources, and we are compliant with uh, with the YAML. So you can actually import uh, Kubernetes YAMLs into Nirmata, or you can uh, generate uh, create these uh, uh, resources in Nirmata and act, uh, uh, export these YAMLs out if needed. So once you have defined your applications, uh, your your deployments or stateful sets, and 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 or or anything else, you can start uh, deploying this. On Nirmata uh, through through an interface or through our through our API, um, and and basically this will get pushed to the cluster, uh, and and you'll see uh, these app this application come up, all the pods come up, and in case there are errors and whatnot, we we reflect that as well uh, in 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 the in the UI. So within a few seconds, you'll see these pods uh, start start being deployed. Uh, at this point. Uh, we're sending down all of the different resources, and uh, and once that's done, these pods will start start coming up. And now this is where uh, once you have a deployment, uh, you can actually uh, create uh, things like auto scaling groups and 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 start scaling up your uh, scaling up your pods. Essentially, that will trigger scaling of the underlying resources, and that's how uh, your 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 cluster can scale. Uh, beyond beyond this beyond uh, the initial size. So this was a quick uh, quick demo. Uh, any any questions? Any anything I can answer? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yes. So in Nirmata, you can create different clusters. And you can map environments, uh, which is our logical uh, grouping of applications, into to, to these clusters. And the same application can be deployed. And one of the things we do, and and you know, because of time constraint, I'm not getting uh, going deep into this. But we have this concept of policies, where uh, to make your application and your YAML portable, you have to make sure that, uh, for example, when you define services like uh, a load balancer service. Uh, for different cloud providers, there may be certain different annotations. So those can be injected through policies, and that makes your application port portable across cloud providers. So that's some of the things we do. Yeah. 
So Spartans is scaling and uh, the underlying resources. So the host group is being created, the hosts and the VMs are being created and managed by Spartans. They get connected to Nirmata. And Nirmata is actually deploying the Kubernetes cluster. And if, uh, if, the, if new instances are added to the Elastic group, they will automatically connect to, uh, to Nirmata and we'll add or we'll scale out the Kubernetes cluster. So essentially add them as worker nodes automatically. Yes, so our, it's, if you think about it, Spartans is, is, is focused on the infrastructure side, uh, making sure the infrastructure is you know, up and running, available, scale, and so on. And we focus on the cluster and the application that's on top of the infrastructure. So we do support, like for other, for cloud providers, we do have direct API integration uh, for, for AWS and other cloud providers. So you don't, but, but Spartans provides that dynamic scalability, which is not, uh, available, uh, you know, directly through these cloud providers. Yes. No, we do support. Uh, so, the, and that's an in interesting question. We do support Helm charts through the cluster. The 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 what we do though is uh, we don't require Tiller to be running. We actually export out the YAML from the chart and then deploy it. Uh, also, if you are familiar with the uh, the Community Helm is actually changing. The architecture is changing. So, so this is this this is in, in flux right now. Thank you.